Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us for um, BFI Fan Conversations number two. Um, and today we're going to be talking about developing sustainable programming models beyond the mainstream. Um, so we're going to be looking at what you might call risky or challenging titles. I'm going to be doing a lot of air quotes today, um, <laughs> and you'll see why in a minute. Um, so basically, yeah, um, we're going to look at kind of um, what that actually means as a concept, this idea of risky or challenging, um, and how we can kind of dismantle that. Um, and then we're going to talk to our, um, amongst our lovely panelists who are here with us today about um, some of their kind of their techniques, um, their horror stories, success stories about content they've programmed and also with our distributors about kind of how everyone can be working together to get the most out of these um, diverse titles. Um, so I think that is more than enough from me. Um, just to introduce myself very quickly though, I'm Delphine Levens. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, um, I am a senior box office analyst for um, Gow Street Analytics. I am sort of active in campaigning for more diversity in film, in the workforce and in the content on UK screens. Um, and also in a past life, I worked at Altitude as well. Um, so some of you might know me from there. Uh, yeah, and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to hand over to our wonderful panelists to um, introduce themselves. And seeing she's first on my screen, I'm gonna pick on Bryony. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Bryony. Um, I work for Altitude now. Um, me and Delphine sadly never overlapped. Um, I think for the sake of the transcription, I'm going to try and speak slower than my usual voice and also say I'm a white lady in my early 30s with graying hair. Um, uh, yeah, Altitude release far too many films a year from documentaries, foreign language, cool indie films to less cool kids animations. So we do a little bit of everything. Um, we we try and make it look like we only release the core things, um, but yeah, we 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 do a, a bit of everything, as I'm sure you know from my constant emails to you all. Great, thank you, Bryony. Um, I also forgot to do my visual description, so I'm really sorry. Um, I am a mixed race woman with braids and a very summery top situation going on um, against a white background with my gray lines to the left of me. Um, and I'm gonna pass over to Federica now. Thank you, just unmuted myself. Um, so my name is Federica. I am the program and marketing manager for Cat for Muse. Um, a couple of things about Cat for Muse, if you don't know it already. Cat for Muse is a multi screen independent cinema uh, situated in southeast London in the borough of Lewisham. Um, it is an independent cinema as well as a community space. So um, we have three screens. We have quite a lot of space that can be hired for community events or for private events. We also have an indoor food market and a cafe. Uh, at the moment, Cat for Muse is the only working independent cinema in the whole borough of Lewisham. And uh, a fun fact about Cat for Muse is that it used to be a Poundland before being a multi-screen cinema. Um, I forgot my description as well. So a uh, white woman, almost 30 years old. And uh, at my back, there's uh, an Agnes Varda poster, which I have, um, which I really love. <laughs> That was great, thank you. Um, and I am from South East London, so I remember when it was a Poundland. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to pass over to Paul now to introduce himself. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'm Paul. I'm the programme manager from Glasgow Film Theatre. Uh, I'm a white man 
in my early 40s, sorry. Uh, and uh, I have a white background. I'm in the GFT office and I've got some film posters and postcards behind me. Um, and I've got dark curly hair also. Uh, GFT is a three screen independent cinema in Glasgow and we play um, big indie new releases, very small indie new releases, old films, new films, films from around the world. We have a lot of partnerships with visiting festivals and we are also the um, host venue for Glasgow Film Festival every year. That's me. Great, and uh, last but by no means least, Sonali. Hi, uh, I'm Sonali. I'm a woman of South Asian origin. Um, I have shoulder length black hair. I'm wearing a pink t-shirt sat against a white background. I'm the founder and director of Day for Night. Um, we're an organization which focuses very much on accessibility and diversity with a particular focus on underrepresented cinemas. So in particular, films from Asia, Latin America and artists moving image. Uh, we straddle both the exhibition and distribution sectors. So we host uh, a festival, Aperture Asia and Pacific Film Festival uh, twice a year. Um, and we work on related curatorial projects um, as a distributor. We release around two to four films theatrically per year, so relatively small scale. And this work has really stemmed from um, our work in exhibition. So we've taken very much a, a curatorial angle into our distribution activities. And all of this is enabled by our work in access, which kind of underpins everything we do. Um, so that's subtitles for non-English language content and for the deaf and hard of hearing and audio description for the blind and visually impaired. Um, and all of that feeds into our wider um, activities around exhibition and distribution. Uh, we've had pretty much a two year gap of being in cinemas. Um, we last held our festival in September, 2019 and our last release was also September, 2019. Um, but we're thrilled to be coming back into cinemas with our latest title, in fact, week after next on the 24th of September. It's a film called Balloon, which is by a Tibetan filmmaker called Pema Seton. And we're delighted to have BFI fan support for this title, which no doubt I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, we're also currently working on a Japanese themed curatorial project, which was intended for last year, inevitably paused, um, and something that we've kind of been rethinking and reframing because the project itself is themed around the built and natural environments alongside recovery and renewal. So themes that are very ripe for discussion right now. Great, thank you so much everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, so to get into uh, the kind of the main topic of today's conversation, um, I thought the best way to start actually would be to kind of examine what does risky or challenging mean to you in terms of film programming? Because I think the main thing we picked up on is that it has different definitions for everyone who's on this panel. Um, so yeah, I think that would be a great place to start. Can you come in at? Oh, I'll go. Um, I mean, I'm not programming them. So from a distributor, uh, from our side, a risky, a risky title that we are starting to work on. Obviously, there's the smaller ones with no talent. There's foreign language is riskier than it used to be. Um, I think the big thing that we struggle with a lot is being kind of a smaller distributor is um, having what we called a, a tweener. So it's not very obvious um, what the audience is, or maybe it is obvious, but there's two very different audiences. And um, it's like, who do we try and focus on? Do we try and get everybody or do we uh, try and focus on one particular one uh, audience? So that's that can be a very risky thing for, for us to try and deal with. Yeah, I, uh, I'll come in here. I think um, there's quite a lot of risk ar around at the moment. Like, I think, you know, the current context, it's quite difficult to know uh, as a programmer what will get an audience or won't. Um, and it's always difficult to know. Like, you know, I'm not saying that uh, you ever know for sure, oh, yeah, this film is going to be a huge success. 
But um, because of like, and certainly in Scotland, which I think maybe more so than in England, you know, there's still um, a lot of reluctance in audiences to commit to coming back to cinema. So it's hard to know exactly which sectors of the audience are all in on cinema, which are not. So, you know, that's thinking about risk right now. But I think my definition of a risky film is anything where I'm not sure if there's already a captive GFT audience that we are kind of connecting with that I can say, yeah, if we play that, I know for sure that there's people who come every week or every month to GFT who are going to prioritize that title. So that does cover quite a lot, really. There's a lot of, of risky titles. And then one other thing I would add is often the smaller titles that are the riskiest are also the ones that you can give the smallest amount of space to in the cinema. You can only play them for two, three, four screenings. So that kind of window being really small increases the kind of potential failure, you know, because you not only have to capture that audience, but you have to communicate to them really clearly. And it's only on these four times. Uh, so, there's sort of a like a, a very narrowing window. The riskier you get, the sort of harder it is almost. It's a bit of an inverse catch-22 or something, in my perspective. Um, I, I think I would say in terms of uh, the work that we do, risk is absolutely inherent in every aspect of our work. Um, and I would even go as far as to say it's pretty much why we exist in terms of trying to open up a bit more space to offer a greater diversity of offerings for audiences, boosting uh, audience choice. And I mean, you mentioned the word challenging and it's, it, it, it's something that I really try and get away from as a concept. Um, I think situating films as challenging is often not particularly helpful. It, I think it puts up barriers as opposed to pushing boundaries, which is I guess what we're trying to do in the small way that we can uh, as a very small organization and working only with a, with a handful of titles every year. But, um, but I think um, part of that risk taking is about looking at the multifaceted nature of our audiences. Um, you know, what's, what's challenging to some audiences isn't necessarily challenging to other audiences. And, um, I, I guess that links a little bit to what, what you're saying, Paul, in terms of um, thinking about what are the opportunities and weighing that up against risk. And that is pretty much what we do with uh, every title that we work with, whether that's um, through our festival or as a distributor. Um, yeah, uh, th that's very interesting, I think. Um what you were saying here but i think uh from my perspective working with cut for muse one of the things that i didn't say is that cut for muse is a uh, relatively very new cinema so it opened in september 2019 uh, which means that for the past year it's been closed for longer than it's been open and that that was definitely challenging in itself um these are challenging times again so it's not just about risky titles but there are so many different factors that influence whether a film will do well or less well um but in terms of what i think are risky titles for us uh i think uh because we are such a young cinema uh the idea that there are some films that audiences might not actively seek out. So obviously um, being two years old, we're, we're actually, in fact, I think yesterday was Cat for Muse's birthday. So we're, we're just about two years old. And uh, uh, some, of the, some of the things that we still have to do and to improve are uh, growing our audiences and creating that kind of, uh, that relationship of trust that will bring more people to actively uh, looking at our program and wanting to take a chance on certain films. And obviously there are different ways to encourage people uh, to go for a title that maybe they wouldn't go for usually because they haven't heard of or because uh, it didn't have a massive uh, marketing campaign. So obviously 
uh, we do try to encourage audiences uh, by doing some community outreach or having days that are quite a lot cheaper uh, uh, for everyone to attend. Uh, and I think that's something, you know, that can definitely be a barrier that um, that some people need to overcome. So having cheaper tickets can really help like pushing titles that we think are more, that we perceive as more risky. Okay, and a question for kind of everyone is, what do you think that exhibitors and distributors could be sort of working on together to help um, try and mitigate the risk involved with um, both releasing or programming these titles? That's a tricky question, I appreciate. Um, um, I, can, I can give it a go. Uh, I think, so another, uh, thing about Cat for Muse is that we work in partnership with the Independent Cinema Office. So uh, they are our programming partners, which means essentially that uh, they help us booking the films, uh, which is, uh, it can be an advantage because it means that, you know, obviously they have a huge amount of experience and connections and they have been doing this with a lot of different venues. So their expertise is uh, really, relevant and it can be really useful for us to get uh, to, to negotiate terms on certain titles. Um, at the same time, I think uh, sometimes what happens is uh, we, we really need to work on a weekly basis with them uh, in terms of, you know, looking at the weekend figures and seeing how certain titles are doing and whether we want to keep them for longer or not. Um, on the other side, working week by week can be tricky because it allows less, uh, you know, you really have a much smaller window to promote certain films. Uh, so definitely one of the things that really works for us, especially with titles that are considered, that are considered riskier, is uh, to just, uh, you know, start promoting and pushing the film as early as possible. And in terms of, I think, of uh, working with uh, distributors, uh, we always welcome uh, special events and Q&As, which I think are really enriching for audiences. Yeah, I uh, have some thoughts on how distributors and exhibitors can work with tricky things. And I think, both of the distributors that we have here today are good at this, so uh, we can maybe reflect on it. <laughs> um, but I think flexibility is a real key, um, and it's something that smaller, more agile distributors are much better at than big ones. Um, and something that I find with titles that you might call niche titles or ones that are that need real targeting in the promotion to find the audience it might be that they perform better uh, further away from their official release date uh, in the cinema, in GFT, uh, and in other cinemas. And distributors like Altitude and Day for Night are aware that that is a real issue. Um, and I think that is the first hurdle to overcome with a distributor, is kind of ensuring that they understand that I understand the local context here and that it may benefit their film to allow its kind of wider publicity to spread from the release date until it sort of lands here in GFT and can pick up the audience that it that it deserves. Um, you know, these are often excellent films that we're talking about. So it's not about sort of wanting to push it out of its spotlight. It's more about wanting to ensure that it really gets the attention it deserves. Like I said before, sometimes it can be quite a narrow window of opportunity that, that you have for that film, because as we all know, there's so many releases uh, coming out all the time. Um, yeah, so I was going to say something else, but I'll leave it there and see if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, I, I, I certainly try to be flexible um, on our releases. I know it's probably easier for us than some of the the bigger studios, um, well, I say easier for us, we're more willing to do it. Um, the, I guess, things that would help us if um, we're talking about kind of riskier titles is, obviously we've got to deal with 
every cinema in the country. So um, we don't obviously know your audiences as well as you do. So if there is things that are working, um, tell us. Um, if there's like a certain audience that you, you know, manage to um, nurture, um, then we might not necessarily know to come to you um, with a title that would be for them. So just obviously, you know, I'm not asking for an email every time a film comes out. Um, but like, you know, if there is some an, an, a, a specific kind of event that you've tried that's really worked, um, even if we don't have something that's like immediately relevant, the amount of films that we get through, there's going to be something that's probably going to match the audience at some point. Um, I think, yeah, we do a lot of things with like grassroots organisations. Um, we try and kind of tap into these specific audiences that we think will go to these films, but we don't always know if it's worked. I mean, sometimes it's impossible to know. Like, uh, for example, when we released Gunda a few weeks ago, we tried to do a lot of work with like vegan societies and things like that. But obviously you can't ask everyone who comes in, uh, are you a vegan? Like, is that why you're here, you know? So it, it's tricky. You're not always gonna have that information. Um, but if there is something that you can see has clearly worked or a certain audience that have turned up for a particular film, um, I'd say don't assume that we know that because you know the most we're going to get is probably admissions data and we might know if a student's come but I'm going to be honest I'm not going through all your admissions data um so yeah tell us if something's working or um you know that we can try and replicate something I think uh yeah flexibility is really um vital and it's key and it's something that we've always tried to be as uh, um, to be as flexible um, as possible. Um, if I can just sort of use one example, um, our most successful film to date is um, an Indian film called Court, which we released in early March. And one of the reasons why it was so successful was because we had it playing in cinemas for one year and nine months, and that was partly because um, we. Uh, hosted quite a large curatorial project centered around um, the 70th anniversary of um, Indian independence and partition in 2017. So we were able to breathe new life into the film um, just short of a year on from when we released it. Um, but we allowed the film just to do, do its thing and, and travel. And, and it was screening somewhere around the country pretty much every month for one year and nine months. And that has been our most successful film to date. I think we had it in about 10 different festivals and 70 plus uh, venues. And so um, I, I guess, um, you know, leaning on us for the support and insight that we can provide as well is um, something that, you know, we try and do and collaborate um, as much you know as, as much as we can we work a lot with um like local community organizations and you know for example here in the northeast um we work very closely with um an organization called gem arts which um is an arts organization championing um diversity in the arts principally around south asia but also the middle east um china as well and they work very much within those communities in the northeast so we work very much with them to develop our audiences locally here um in london um we had a, a fantastic partnership with an organization called the inter-island collective um for a film that we released um about three years ago a film called waru a film from new zealand um an ensemble piece uh made up of um, eight short films by eight female Maori filmmakers. And we worked with this organization, which is very much community based um, on um, uh, fostering more dialogue between those communities and, and beyond, and then bringing that into our audience development. So we want to bring this expertise that we might, that we might be able to lean on to cinemas as well, to say, well, you know, we might have this particular film and this is what we can bring with it. Um, the other thing I think it would be remiss not to mention, um, kind of whilst we're here having a BFI fan conversation, is the sort of support that you can get from the BFI um, audience fund, from BFI fan, from schemes like Movie Go. Um, I know Sonali, obviously you've had um, 
kind of success with that in the past. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk to that, if anyone else wants to talk to kind of um, how, how useful that funding can be. Um, very quickly before that as well, um, I did forget to mention, and I see Film Hub Scotland have just posted it in the chat, there's a Q&A button, uh, button at the bottom of the screen. It's next to the chat icon, I believe. So if anyone's got questions they'd like me to put to our panellists, um, if you can please put them in the Q&A section, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry. So BFI funding, um, how useful is it? I mean, certainly with um, our next title, Balloon, um, it's so, so welcome. And it's allowing us to do so much more that we can do with a film that we believed so strongly in. Um, we, we acquired it literally just before the pandemic um, and have been sitting on it, waiting for the right moment to, to bring it to audiences. And, and we feel that now, you know, we've, we've worked on it a lot over the last year and with... Um, fantastic input from from BFI fan um, it's allowed us to look at publicity around the film from a whole range of angles um, guaranteeing um, x number of venues from the outset lays that foundation but for a small di distributor like ourselves is always um, uh, it's always tricky from from the outset getting our venues on board and then being able to build from there so that kind of foundation that we've uh, got from that BFI fan support and all of the in-kind support that comes around that um, and all of the ideas that we've been sort of exchanging around uh, different novel things that we can do it, it, it's all been so so valuable um, and I'm sure that it's enabling us to do a lot more with the film than we would have been able to do otherwise. Um, yeah we've uh, had I'm trying to think Useful. We've used them a lot for, uh, I say use them, work with them. Um, the, yeah, just the general support and awareness. I think I'm probably not the best at giving them notice because our films seem to appear last minute. Um, but yes, when we've got enough notice, then um, it's very useful. I know we have a film called Ali and Ava, the new uh, Cleo Bernard or Clio Bernard um, in February. And this is my reminder to myself to let you know, Ty, because I know you're listening. Um, so yeah, I think that's the perfect sort of title to um, work with the regional marketers on that. Um, and we're gonna be doing our own um, regional marketing support for that. Obviously it's a film that was made in Yorkshire. So hopefully they'll want to come see it. Um, it's you know, we've also worked with um, the young programmers, um, the pack that they put together, um, and it's that kind of um, thing that it'd be really useful um, to know how much that makes a difference when I know that goes out to um, programmers. Um, but yeah, obviously we, we take the bookings, we don't know what's prompted you to book something necessarily um so if that kind of thing is useful yeah do do flag it that that's where you've kind of heard about something um and then we can keep keep doing it yeah i think um from my perspective programming films the bfi fan support is not a deciding factor as to whether i'll book a film or not but that's partly you know that's different for everyone that's gft there's a lot you know you kind of know roughly which films you're going to go for or not. What I find is really good is when that BFI fan support identifies a film that you can really see is going to benefit in a way that it wouldn't otherwise. I think that's really true of Balloon. I'm really pleased that they've chosen that one. I think it's hit and miss sometimes though. For example, Another Round was one of the titles, which I think is probably for me at the top end of like mainstream indie. I mean, it won the Oscar, it's Mads Mikkelsen. It doesn't need a lot of help. Uh, and I'm speaking purely from my own context at GFT where I know we have much more of a solid core audience than maybe some of the other people who are watching here. So I don't mean to like take that for granted, but purely from my perspective, Another Round's not a film that needed that help. And there were perhaps other smaller titles at the time. Uh, for example, one, I'm jumping ahead a bit. One which 
did really well for us, but could have done even better was Martin Eden, um, the new wave release, which was about the same kind of time, much riskier than another round for sure, but also much more worth, I think, highlighting to an audience who perhaps missed it. Um, so that's just one uh, reflection on the, on the BFI fan support. It's a great initiative, but I would sometimes like to interrogate the choices a little more. So yeah, um, Paul doing my job for me. Uh, so thanks very much there. Um, kind of the next thing that I was hoping to move on to is to kind of ask Paul and Federica about kind of um, how they define success in their venues. Is it just in terms of box office or is it in terms of audience outreach, seeing a new audience coming in? Um, and yeah, the films that you've worked on recently that have pleasantly surprised you or the films you wanted to work but they didn't attract an audience. If you could just, yeah, reflect on kind of successes and I don't want to call them failures, but lessons learned over the past year or so, that'd be really interesting. Um, yeah, so I think uh, there are different metrics for success. So it really, it really depends on, on what kind of metric you're thinking about. And uh, there's definitely, uh, let's say a sort of uh, quality versus quantity. So I think as Bryony was saying before, sometimes you get, uh, you know, you look at some figures, but you're not quite able to, uh, to, to know a lot more from the figures than, you know, uh, what the final box office is. But uh, working within the venue, there's definitely, uh, you know, being able to, to get that audience's feedback is really important. And so there are films which I think on paper didn't, uh, didn't do that well, but I remember uh, getting really good feedback in the venue. I think in between lockdowns, we screened a documentary called uh, The Painter and the Thief, uh, which yes, didn't really have great numbers but I remember getting really good feedback for it both in the uh, both in the venue and on social media so that was something uh, that was quite interesting um, at the same time obviously you've got to look at the figures and it's really important uh, to just you know to keep in mind that certain films you just know will do better than others. Um, in terms of Cat for Muse, we know that we have a really strong uh, family audience. So uh, that's something that we can, uh, that we can always rely on in terms of making good numbers. And that's really important for us to know because if we know that we have a family film that is going to do really well, then uh, we can, you know, we can have another film playing in a different screen, which is one of the titles that we can, would consider riskier. So there definitely, there is that balance that really helps. And yeah, I just think it depends on, uh, on which way you're looking at, um, at, yes, how to define success. Yeah, I um, totally agree. Uh, and I, that point that you just made there, Federica, about if you've got something that's like a sure thing in your big screen, then it does allow you to sort of be more uh, experimental, which again uh, sort of backs up that thing about timing. And maybe sometimes it's better to hold off on a smaller release because you know you can sort of give it the space uh, another time. But in terms of success, yeah, I think the sort of measure of success for me is it's always uh, based on expectation. Uh, so if I expect something to do well, then it's disappointing if it doesn't. But if, I, if I'm really not sure and just hopeful about something and it does great, then that's success. And to point out a few specifics, Stephanie, you asked about the last year, what's surprised us, what's been good, what's been disappointing. I found like, um, I think modern films have made some really good choices with the films that they've been putting out. And they seem to have a really great way of just, I don't know, tapping into the zeitgeist with some of their releases. So we showed their tiny documentary, Hilma F. Clint, Beyond the Visible, back in October when we were sort of open between lockdowns, just for a few screenings. And it did really well. And that sort of boosted, we had it online as well from Modern. 
and that boosted viewing online. It just, I know we have the art school close by, so in Glasgow, it shouldn't have surprised me that much. But still, I was like, wow, um, that was great. And then similarly, earlier this year, um, I did a few shows of Sisters with Transistors, another doc from Modern, which I hoped would do well because I thought it was great. And we'd even had it online already on our online player during lockdown. But there was something about it. There was something sort of in the air where I felt like people still want to see this film. Uh, and it was gratifying for that to be proved true and to like get a good audience into the cinema for that. Um, and then a recent one, which Altitude released, which surprised me, um, which did well, was Pig, the Nicolas Cage movie. Um, and that's a really interesting one because you, you can take Nicolas Cage films for granted and his audience for granted and be like, well, yeah, there will be an audience, but it might not be for us. But that film seemed to break through in a little bit, in a little way where it, it sort of had a much wider audience. Like my mum saw the trailer and was like, oh, that looks good. And like that was, you know, my mum's not into Nicolas Cage movies. Um, and that sort of tipped me off that this might be something that could reach a bit further. And we ended up playing it at GFT quite a lot longer than I originally anticipated. Um, and then in terms of disappointments, I wanna mention a few more Altitude titles, Brian, because I think it would be really interesting to sort of hear your take on how these films did, because the two films I wanna mention are ones that I absolutely love and really had quite high hopes for um, at GFT. One was Rocks back, and that was last kind of, October, was it? It was between sort of September, September, October. It was when we were opening between lockdowns. And I mean, I loved the movie. I really had a lot of hopes for it, but something about it, it just didn't connect um, with a, a half as big as an audience as I, as I would have hoped at, at, in Glasgow. And we really kind of pushed it as, as much as we could. And then the other one, the picture that's been used on all of the promotion for this event, Night of the Kings, Another film which I, you know, loved since seeing it back at TIFF, and we did a really great um, launch event for it with We Are Parable, and that, you know, we maybe talk a little bit about partnerships and how that grows the audience for, um, or can grow the audience for challenging films. Certainly, without that event, I think Night of the Kings would have been, you know, even not as successful as it was at GFT, but again, when I saw that film, I thought, this is great. This is really gonna connect. It's sort of elements of City of God and it's a bit Romeo and Juliet and it's a bit, and then how that translated was, I think people just didn't know what it was. Um, something broke down in communication, whether that was the trailer, whether that was the way it was written about, it just didn't capture people in the way that I knew it could. So those two, I reckon, are ones that I would, yeah, say. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that you thought Night of the Kings was going to work because it was one that I was always a bit uh, nervous about. I um, don't know how much I should have said that. Um, it, just because, as you said about modern films, um, the, they got something like in the, in the zeitgeist and, and somehow can ride that wave. And that was one of the titles that as much as you try and generate buzz for it, it just didn't seem to cut through. And obviously there's always going to be something um, intangible about which films get the buzz and which don't. And obviously lots of films which deserve it don't get it. Um, but that was one which definitely felt like we couldn't quite get that buzz going for it. And I think um, when we picked it up, it was going to be the Ivory Coast um, nomination for the foreign language Os Oscar, which it was, but it didn't make the shortlist. And I think obviously that's going to help. Um, that's just kind of a, just sign signify something about the film that it, it just didn't cut through. Um, so that was disappointing for us. And then, yeah, obviously working with We Are Parable was kind of an obvious thing to do on that film. And, and it, I think you're right, even though it wasn't very successful, I think without them, it would have been even worse. Um, I think they obviously can just amplify it and bring it a bit more noise, especially, I mean, I see it 
on social media. I don't know how much that translates into venues. Um, it, it'd be great to know if it does. Um, I, um, yeah, as yeah, I say, it can I, really, I, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, just like social media can be, it's really hard sometimes there can be even sort of in Glasgow and in response to our own tweets about things there can be loads of interest but then in terms of actual people coming to see the film and maybe it's that timing thing again of people are like oh yeah I'm gonna see that oh I've missed it you know like and that's that's that thing of like I'm sort of trying to really get that sorry I interrupted no no I it's it's totally yeah we live obviously in a bubble and we're like oh everybody's talking about this film and then it comes to opening weekend and no one's buying a ticket um yeah so uh what was the other one you mentioned rocks obviously rocks is so hard to judge because it was supposed to come out in april and obviously we had to delay it so how much i can blame on the pandemic i'm gonna try and blame quite a lot of it on that because i think people absolutely loved that film me included um and i think for the time for the timing and everything of it the overall box office i was quite pleased with um it definitely worked in london east london specifically a lot better than it worked everywhere else um which is kind of you know it's predictable that's where it was filmed and it's also a reflection on of how much we worked with every partner and their dog on that film we did uh, we are parable. We did bounce. We did a bird's eye view. Every group got its own kind of Q and A, and we did so many Q and As into run up of um, before the April release, and then obviously had to put it on ice and try and redo it again in September. Um, so for us, we don't really consider it a failure. Um, or I that wouldn't. Yeah, no, I don't either. And I, I think it's like that kind of thing where I think rocks continues to have a life like and it only grows in popularity and it is ultimately going to find that audience i think the disappointment is that it didn't quite find the audience in the kind of couple of weeks that it was available at gft but yeah. the longer life and the sort of bigger reputation of the film is unquestionable uh, so yeah not a failure but personal disappointment <laughs> yeah for sure i think um I'm skipping ahead a bit, probably. Delphine, sorry. Um, yeah, but that's fine. Like, you absolutely can. I've got a point to bring <laughs> back, but yeah, please skip ahead. That's fine. We're getting, um, we've got 15 minutes left, so. Oh, God. Um, just really one thing <laughs> I want to, to quickly answer was um, one of the questions is um, about how distributors can like develop an audience for these kind of films. And I think, um, obviously, because we're trying to get everyone to go to every cinema, um, one of the things that distributors can do is really build their brand and it's easier for some than others obviously Sinali does more specific films and so for altitude it's a bit harder because we do so many different things but if people can identify oh this is an altitude film it's probably going to be good that's something we can do um and obviously it relies on us picking good films um but yeah I'll go back to you now I'll stop talking no, I mean, it's been great and I wish we could do this for three hours, to be honest with you. There's so many things to touch on. But just one thing I wanted to kind of track back to, because I think it's a really interesting point um, when Paul mentioned his mum. But I just kind of wanted to ask Paul and Federica, like, who do you go to to consult about programming? Who helps you with your programming choices? And also, how do you kind of spot those titles that might fall into the risky category, but you think with... A bit of nurturing their work how do you spot those titles kind of ahead of time to give you enough time to nurture them um yeah first of all i was gonna say just to close uh the the, the rocks chapter it, it played amazingly like it, it did really well like at for muse i think it was on for maybe five weeks maybe six weeks so that was uh that was great. It just really connected with the audiences. I think it looked that way on social media and it really translated into the venue as well, which was really cool. Um, and in terms of discussing our program, um, obviously, as I mentioned before, we work with the independent cinema office and I think that is uh, 
really valuable for me in terms of the input that I can get from them. Uh, it's an external perspective from the venue. So obviously they, they oversee um, the programming for different cinemas and they will have a sense of what works in other places as well. We also look at the national box office average with them. So that's really, that's something really useful to discuss for us and to see how a film compares to the rest of the UK. Um, on the other side, uh, I do discuss the films uh, with some of the staff in the venue because uh, I can get good feedback from the venue, but someone else can. Sometimes even just the staff who are at the box office, they get quite a lot of feedback and that's really interesting for us to hear. Uh, but yes, working with the, the staff and house, with the general manager as well, uh, it really helps uh, trying to figure out what's what's best for the program. And then obviously, yeah, mentioning family and friends, I think um, I do have quite a lot of friends who I I, lo I love to get input from uh, from friends in the sector who might have a different perspective. I I was in Scotland for quite a long time, so I think there's still a few people there whom I'm really interested uh uh, in hearing their opinions about certain films. And it's definitely, it really helps with, uh, even with finding out uh, about titles which might not be on my radar. So, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I am, um, sorry, I won't take too long because I know we're pushing for time, but just sort of agree that like, I think Brian mentioned being in a bubble in a different context, but I find it really useful to sort of gauge from friends who are not in the film industry, what films they've even heard of, you know, like um, to try and get a sense of, wow, that film's really broken through because my friend who knows, you know, nothing about, or doesn't keep up with cinema has mentioned it. And those can sometimes be surprising. Um, and yeah, in terms of who I would talk to, well, our CEO here, Alison Gardner has been programming for, many, many years and it's very experienced. So if there's something I'm unsure about, I'll often ask her. And then we also have a great um, financial director who does loads of brilliant stats. So it's really good if I'm thinking, should we bring something back to be able to look really clearly and see how it did and if there's still an audience seemingly there. And just like Federico was saying, front of house staff are really uh, vital for, you know, they've got the connection with the audience actually coming in and often, and I'll encourage them and often they will kind of drop an email to say, are we gonna be showing this? Cause so-and-so asked about it or have you heard of this film or when is this film being released? And it always amazes me how people get different information about films. Like they won't know about the film that's coming out in two weeks time that I think has been promoted pretty heavily through our cinema, but they will know about a film that just premiered at quite an obscure festival and has no UK distributor and no upcoming release date. And I have no idea if we'll ever show it. It's really, you know, very difficult to, uh, to know what people are gonna want. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. And it's quite funny. My dad's um, half Belgian and he's always sending me random Belgian films and asking who their UK distributor is. And I'm like, no, they don't have one, funnily enough. <laughs> And it does, it really surprises you, doesn't it? Like what your friends and family pick up on. Um, so I wanted to move it on. Sorry, Federico, I don't know if you had a point and I interrupted you. Um, I wanted to go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to mention the case of, yeah, Demon Slayer. Uh, someone, yeah, someone told me about it months before it even had a UK release. It was actually one of the people in the staff at Cat for Muse. And, uh, and I was really surprised when it even got a UK release because I, I mean, I wasn't surprised at that point, but uh, a few months before it got an actual UK release, I didn't know how big a success it was in Japan, but then obviously it got a release here. So then we, uh, we had it on for a couple of screenings as well. So a lot of, I think we also take a chance in terms of risky titles, again, we take a chance on suggestions from staff and locals alike. So at the moment we're screening The Last Bus, which uh, I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to, to screen, but then someone locally told me, 
Oh, I, I think you definitely should have this title because Timothy Spall used to live locally and lots of people love him and I think people will come and watch the film and, uh, and they even helped promoting the film so we do give a chance to titles even if it's on recommendation of locals because I think uh, that might it, it's also a strategy so yeah that's really great so yeah I mean I think we've touched a bit on the question I was going to pose last anyway, which is great because um, we're, we're coming towards the tail end of things. But um, I think maybe just if Bryony or Sonali, you have anything more to say about kind of how you think exhibition could support you more effectively or just some examples of like some really good work that you've done with ex exhibits that have helped you to expand the audience for a film. Um, that would be really interesting. Well, I guess I mentioned um, a little bit earlier on about some of the partnerships that we've built up with um, various uh, community um, organisations. And that we often find is kind of the, a bit of a bridge between us as a distributor and um, cinemas and local audiences. So uh, I think that's very much something that we build into what we try to do with each film. And, you know, like I said initially, we're, we're only working with two to four films maximum a year so each one of those films we want to invest as much time and energy and love that we can give give to them because we are a small organization with very limited um resources um but um i mean i, I go back to the example i i gave of waru that um film from new zealand um we we had such a phenomenal response to to that film um and uh, we did a number of uh, Q and A's. Uh, we did uh, one around International Women's Day as well, and the audience response. There was just so much energy from what we were able to bring, sort of beyond our own expertise and the work that we'd all also been doing with our festival as well. So I think that was one um, really, really strong example of, you know, working with uh, partnerships in particular communities, community organisations. Uh, where that, that has really worked well. Um, I suppose that um, just kind of linking back to what uh, we were talking about a, a little earlier, um, I can also give an example of one film that um, we really felt should have done better and it really didn't. And we weren't able to get it into many venues and, I'm, and we were just so surprised at the time. It's um, a Japanese film called um, Hotori no Sakuko, um, but it went by a French title, Au revoir l'été, and that was the decision of the filmmaker and I think played a significant part in why the film kind of got lost. So we, we weren't able to screen it particularly widely. We really wanted to do more. That it I think out of all the films we've released, it's had overall the best reviews. Um, Mark Commode absolutely adored that film, uh, but he also picked up on that point of using a French title, even if it's what, what the director really wanted to do it didn't position the film in a way that it was really going to speak to audiences and therefore speak to exhibitors as well. That said, with the Japanese project that we're going to be working on imminently, um, hopefully it'll be a little bit like Court and we can um, breathe some new life into it. Rene, do you have anything you want to add before we wrap up? Oh, um, I don't think so. I mean, the... Yeah, we, I'm trying to think what exhibitors could do for us. Um, I think really simple things like let us know if you don't have a poster or a trailer. Um, that, I mean, I might regret saying that when I get 700 emails, um, but the, yeah, we don't know if you're not playing a trailer. We, are, we kind of send them out and assume that it's playing. Um, yeah, if you, you know. Let us know. Ask for what you need. Um, you know, there's probably stuff that we have that you will want. Social media stuff. Um, we we make marketing packs for all our films. So if you don't have one, there probably is one. Um, yeah, ask us. That's really great. Thank you. Um, I was telling Paul the story about back when I was <laughs> doing theatrical sales at Altitude, and Alison Gardner said everyone needs to stop sending us postcards. And then I then despaired thinking about 
the thousands of postcards I'd sent to GFT <laughs> over the years. Um, so yeah, I think definitely that's a really good point. Um, Don't even mention postcards. Don't even mention. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of, we've come to the end, nobody's used the Q&A box, um, so I'm afraid if you did have a question, you've only got about two minutes to get it in, um, and I'm going to just continue along. Yeah. There was a, a good point made, um, I think Mark Cosgrove from Watershed had suggested that there's an issue here with the kind of bottleneck of releases, especially for smaller films. And Claire had agreed with that from Cardiff. And I would agree with that also. Like, I think particularly at this moment, if we're looking at like the next few weeks in September and early October, and it happened when the James Bond film was going to be released like 18 months ago, it's like all the small distributors decide oh, we'll do some alternative programming to the James Bond film, which is a great idea, but not if 20 distributors all decide to do that on the same week, which is kind of what has happened. And I feel sometimes like there isn't that much awareness from distributors I'm speaking to of what else is being released, or there's a kind of willful ignoring of other things that are being released. And they're kind of just saying, well, why don't you just play my film? Because it's the best. And that doesn't work you know <laughs> uh so yeah anyway we're coming to the end of the time i don't really want to open up that big kind of worms but it is worth kind of noting it if i can just add to that point um i mean often we'll we'll put a title in the release schedule thinking this is this looks like a really optimum time for for this film for all manner of different reasons and everything sort of fits but then several more and more and more sort of come further down the line and then it's kind of out of our control so it's um, it's tricky, and I, I, t I totally take take that point that there are a lot of films being released, and this was happening obviously before pa the pandemic um, as well. But I think I would also add that you know, if going back to what we were saying right at the beginning about um, risky titles and creating the space for risky titles, I think it all comes back to the audience and nurturing an appetite within audiences, so that you know, looking further towards the future and building our future audiences. We need to kind of lay the groundwork there and keep on building on that. So the offerings kind of need to be there, but of course that has to be balanced with what is actually happening, you know, with it within the space as well. We've had a question in the Q&A box. I think we've had two. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do two, but we're gonna go for, we'll go for, for the first one. Um, so the first one was just, and I think it's quite a nice uh, conclusion question actually if anyone has any advice for young and aspiring programmers. Run away. <laughs> yeah, mine would be just, just watch films always, constantly. And also it is probably the lowest turnover job in the entire UK. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, go for it, you know, like watch films and any opportunity that you get to program them take it, you know, like, uh, or even my route into programming was adjacent to programming. I didn't, you know, I sort of started in marketing and came from a website background. So, you know, and then and film journalism. So uh, yeah, like my advice is kind of pursue the end goal, but take any route possible to get there. And I think also um, sort of finding your area and your subject and something that you know really well um, is always going to stand you in in good stead. I mean, I came from background of French cinema and ended up in Asian cinema, but somewhere along the way that that's where my journey took me. But um, uh, I mean, now Asian cinema is principally what what I do and what our organisation does, not exclusively. But I think we've kind of carved out a space for that uh, within the kind of exhibition and distribution landscape now in the UK after a lot of work and over many years of course. Okay um, so I'd love to continue this conversation but we do have to wrap up um, and I've got a few things I need to say as we wrap up. Um, so first of all uh, thank you so much to everyone who has come to watch today. I know we're having our glorious summer outside so I really appreciate people kind of spending time indoors listening to us prattle on. Um, additionally, thank you so much to all of these wonderful panellists. Um, I think they're all uh, 
amazing people with some really amazing insights. Um, and I'm so pleased we we're able to bring them all together today. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and have a great rest of your day.